that we've uh, all taken a deep breath and gotten into our seats. Uh, I'm going to introduce very quickly our um, MC for the day, our MC for the past four years. She will get a more thorough introduction uh, in a few hours. Um, but for right now, I will just say welcome and thank you to Lynn Wolf. Morning, everybody, and thanks for being here. Uh, we're in for a great day. Uh, like Stephanie said, <laughs> to wipe that grin off your face, artisty. Uh, yeah, no, we're in for a great day. And uh, thanks to my partner, Drew, for uh, all the hard work in putting this uh, program together. Um, it's time to tune up your avalanche brain. Um, Brenton just talked to you about tuning up your skills, your physical skills you know, how to do an ECT, a PST, but just as important is how to think about the hazards that you're uh, about to encounter, how to think about your decision making. And I think that this day will help jumpstart your decision making. And I'm giving you some homework. Yeah, that's right. It's the homework that I give you every year and pick out from today's presentations what it is that you want to take with you into the field or into your planning this year, okay? All right, moving on to our first, our keynote speaker. It's my absolute pleasure, my absolute honor to introduce my friend Dale Adkins. Dale's been working for 30 years with avalanche professionals, mountain rescuers around the world. He's an expert in lots of different areas, but one thing I love about Dale is how deeply he thinks about stuff. He thinks about it and then he can actually pretty articulately say what he's thinking and get us to think about things too. So today Dale's going to be talking about avalanche accidents, the illusion of control, and the perils of positive outcomes. Dale, welcome. Oh, now I got some pressure on me to live up to that. So I'll, I'll give my best here. Hey, as, as starting this off, I would like everybody who's been involved in the organization and managing of, of this workshop to please stand up so that we can see you, and I'd like for all of us to give them a round of applause. So if you've been involved in this and organizing it, please stand up. Please stand up. Thank you. What's that? Well, that's good, good. That's, <laughs> so, but when you see them, as Stephanie said earlier, you know, please thank them during the breaks and when you, when you run into them. Also, I would like all of you to stand up and give yourself an applause. Seriously, please stand up this way, please. Because you have made a commitment to come out and start that process. Okay, sit down. It also gives me an idea who's still asleep. But no, thank you very much for coming out. Because I need to butter you up, because we're going to start with some questions here. How many beams do you see? How many say three? How many say four? OK, how many threes? How many fours? How many are like, OK, both? Yeah. <laughs> This is a, I love this illusion because I think it's a great illustration of the conundrum that we deal with avalanches. Is it stable? Is it not stable? Well, it's probably somewhere in between. And that somewhere in between, that is this domain, well, technically we call it conditional stability, but I'm not going to go into that. But what does that mean for you and me? That is the uncertainty that we deal with. And I think you'll hear that theme come up quite a bit today. Oh, boy, you hear a pilot who says this. How many of you want to fly with that pilot? Where are the hands? Yeah, that's kind of a terrifying thing. Okay, I'm going to change two words. I'm going to change the activity, and I'm going to change the threat. How many of us have been that guy? Yeah, there's a number of hands that go up. Ah, so here's this disconnect. For basically the two same judgments, errors in judgment, mistakes in judgment, or how they've made those judgments, 
we, for the pilot, say, oh, that's a bad thing to do. But when it comes to mountain adventures, we have this twisted ethic of going, cool, <laughs> that's pretty new. We tend to idealize people that make bad judgments, bad decisions in the mountains. And that's a, a weird ethic that we do. So think about that. Because that ethic, what it leads to, you know, maybe why do we think that? Why is it okay for the skier, but it's not okay for the pilot? Well, because when we go out, most of the time, nothing happens. We have a great time. Well, why do we have a great time? Why were we successful? Well, we tend to relate that to our skills and our knowledge and our abilities. And that sets up this illusion of control. And the more we go out and do things and we have success, what do we do? We keep doing it. That's feedback. That's positive feedback. Positive feedback amplifies. Amplifies behavior, so we do it more and more. And most, for most of us, we get away with it. But sometimes our luck runs out. And this is this illusion of control and the perils of positive outcomes. So I want to look at this from an accident's perspective. Here's my take-home message. So if you forget everything else that I talk about, please remember these five things, or at least remember this sixth thing at the bottom. Yeah, we're going to be, be humble, practice sense-making, use some imagination. It's okay to speculate. Add some devil into your activities out there. And interruptions are actually good in what we do. And the bottom line, and this I want you to read this aloud for all of us, because I wrote it in the first person so that, that you say it, I say it. So all together now, one, two, three. Safety should be born in the belief that everything I do can lead to a potential disaster. This is actually a theme practiced in high, re high reliability organizations, organizations and people that work in very high consequence situations and environments. So that's my take-home message. So now you can settle back into whatever you were doing. So what I hope to do today with a goal is to change your perspective on accidents and human error from this first story of what happened to really asking and thinking about why did it happen. And if you don't know why it happened, use your imagination. And we often don't say in our reports why an accident happened. We, we write about what happened, but we don't say why. And if you can identify why it happened, or it makes sense to you why it happened, you've just identified a vulnerability, or your vulnerabilities. And we're actually, we're not very good at predicting uh, erroneous actions. We're not good at predicting those things. But we're actually pretty good at spotting vulnerabilities and interpreting those. So that's really what we should be looking for. Oh, this is a great quote. The greatest enjoyment is to live dangerously. <laughs> Nietzsche, anybody know his other quote that Nietzsche said? What's that? What's that? Yes, that is, and within the, I think it was even with that book that he wrote, yes, that does not kill us, makes us stronger. Okay, Nietzsche went crazy a few years later. <laughs> you can tell how well that, this stuff worked out for him, but that's a whole other story and we won't get into that. But danger is exciting, and that's kind of our, and that excitement from danger is our reward. It's one of the reasons we do these things. This is an adaption of a, of, of a curve that Werner Munter did a bunch of years ago, Bruce Jameson. You may have seen things similar with this. We have our danger scale across the bottom. A big problem I have with the danger scale is that we treat it as it's being sequential, that it's linear, and it's not. Avalanche, avalanche danger, avalanche potential, is exponential. So each time you take one step up in the danger rating, you're actually doubling the potential the danger potential. But when we look at where most accidents happen and when they happen, it's during this moderate and considerable time, even, even high danger. And 
that is when our, our confidence is actually high at low danger, it's high at extreme danger. That's easy, that's simple forecasting. It's that whole in between. That's tough, that's where we get in trouble. Remember how you said earlier about that with the beams, that middle ground, that conditional stability. That's the do domain of uncertainty. So I call it the bucket of uncertainty here. And this is where we have our biggest challenges, whether we're recreationalists or we're professional forecasters, rescuers, in making those decisions. In our decisions, because we're dealing with this uncertainty, it's all about judgment. This is a wonderful quote from Ernest Mock. You know, our, our knowledge and our errors comes all from the same place. And it's only how it turns out that we can tell if it was a success or not. So we can't really change the thinking. There's no difference in thinking between errors and, and knowledge. It's just how does it play out. And when we deal with uncertainty, we've got to be very cautious about outcomes. Because it's uncertain. We don't know the outcomes. But we can manage the process. When we look at traditional avalanche education and accident reports and talk about them, we tend to really focus or emphasize the missed cues. We call them clues in the avalanche world. Oh, you didn't look hard enough. You don't know enough. You need to look harder. You need to be more careful with it. But when you're dealing with accidents with avalanche-aware people, and these days about three-quarters of the people that die in avalanches have had avalanche awareness training. And a lot of those people have had significant amounts of avalanche training. So the problem is not the missed cues. People are sensing them. They're identifying them. It's how they interpret and then how they incorporate that meaning into their decisions. They see the things, but it's how they act on them. Alice in Wonderland, well, at least in the Walt Disney version, this great quote, I give myself very good advice, but I very seldom follow it. How often have we all been there in that? So here's some topics. I've got a half dozen topics, and we'll, I'll throw this slide up as we move through, but from accidents, and it'll go some terms and concepts. Dysfunctional momentum is a concept that we haven't talked about in the avalanche world, but I think it's, it's prevalent, and I think it's a very important one. And the devil's advocate, and then I hope to give you some advice to help us stay out of trouble when we're out there. So let's look at accidents, and I'm going to briefly throw up a few accidents. This happened this last spring in Colorado at Aspen Highlands. Uh, and this is outside of the ski area, but here's some of the weather the first week of April. Yeah, typical springtime. Warm days, cold nights, a little dusting of snow, and then we got rain. In Colorado, we don't like to have rain with it. And, we, and to actually see significant rain up to 11,000 feet is pretty unusual, or at least it used to be unusual for us in Colorado. Cooled off, got a little bit of snow. And then on April 8th, or the night of the 7th to the morning of the 8th, eight inches of snow fell. It was not the champagne powder promised by Ski Country USA. It was more like soggy coffee grounds with a density of, uh, what, an inch and a half of water equivalency. It was very windy during the storm. Winds out of, at 30, gusting up to 60 with it. But fortunately, the winds died off right around sunrise or shortly after. Ski area was able to open uh, their upper mountain lifts. So if you look at a storm total, and I know that three inches and eight inches does not add up to 12.2, but that's what Ethan gave me. Um, <clears throat> it's called, you know, we work in approximations with it, but. Anyways, it was heavy, wet snow, and that's something we don't really have, even in springtime in Colorado. But maybe more importantly, the Avalanche Center, they recognized this danger. It's pretty obvious, high danger. They had a warning in effect. So there's two guys. Uh, one is a longtime Aspen resident. He's a hard charger. He spent decades going out into the mountains and skiing. He's been through aval some avalanche training because he was in a course that I did many, many years ago. Uh, he's with a buddy from out of town visiting. They're going to go. This is what we're looking at is Maroon Bowl. It's not part of the managed terrain within the ski area. Someday, maybe it will be. Um, but everyone likes to ski off to the looker's left in Highlands Bowl. Some wonderful big alpine terrain. It's walk to hike to terrain. But anyways, their whole goal that day was not to ski inside the ski area. It was to go into Maroon Bowl, this bowl right here. 
And what do you see in the kind of the center part, the upper center part? A nice avalanche. The ski patrol triggered a small soft slab because they do some mitigation work along the hiking route. And as that ran down, it stepped down and broke out a much larger, deeper avalanche, three to four feet deep. That's what you see when you get off the lift. That's what these guys saw. That's what they walked towards. In fact, they skied over the debris. This is 1.30, so sometime shortly after it, these two fellows head down through the trees, a little more west facing. They cross over the debris. They know it's there. And they go down into the flats. And what you're looking at, that's about 1,000 vertical feet that they skied. Then their plan was to hike back up just a few hundred feet to a little rock outcrop, take the skins off and then ski down, and then it's another couple of thousand feet down to the road. Great place to ski. Very doable. They picked a really lousy day to do it. So they start up. So this is at 1.30. So here by 2 o'clock we can see their tracks, and in fact, we can even spot the fellows in the trees. So they're trying to work their way up through the trees and they're just going to go to the very tip of the little uh, stand of trees that they're in. That's their plan. That's what they agreed upon with it. Ah, but they got a little bit higher up. Ah, let's put another couple of turns in. No problem. So 210, there they are. They're hiking up and at this point they're like, you know, this game is pretty good. Let's go a little higher up with it. So what they want to do is they want to go to the island of trees well up the slope. That's their goal now. So they start up, they get about halfway up, things don't feel good. And at this point, they don't like the situation and they think we need to bail off to our right, to the climber's right. They want to get into those trees. This is at 220. They didn't get very far in the next few minutes because they released the avalanche. This is at 230. It's amazing what you can find on the internet. <laughs> but um, this is a very unusual accident because they're able to kind of track their progress and really see what they were doing in real time. So here we are, 230, they've been swept down. It's about 500 vertical feet in the avalanche. The one fellow, he's, he's able to stand up and he starts a transceiver search. He yells for his friend, there's no response. He starts working uphill. Numbers are going down. Great. But then his numbers jumped up. And what did he do? He said, oh, it can't be up here. It's got to be down slope. He turns around. There's also clues down below. So he turned around and went down slope. When your numbers jump up, you're doing transceiver search. What should you always do? Take a couple extra steps. See if those numbers are really jumping up or are you in a null? With it. But he turned around. He starts back down. This is at 240, there he is there, he's searching downhill. He also calls a, a friend. Instead of calling 911, he called a friend. Please call 911, because the 911 operators, there's a very good chance they can get your coordinates to where you are. Um, but he's searching, he's doing the best he can, but he's not finding them. By now the ski patrol knows what's going on. They actually spot his friend where the star is. You may be able to see it, you might not. I'll, Highlight it in just a moment. It, by 3 o'clock, and the fellow's actually well down out of the picture or behind the tree, ski patrol is able to make contact with him and get him to move back up slope. And by 3.10, he's actually back up. He's found his friend who's unresponsive, uh, unconscious. He's doing CPR, and it doesn't work. This doesn't end well. Really experienced people have some avalanche training. All the warning signs were there. They let themselves get into trouble. Smuggler's Notch, Vermont. Last winter, this past uh, almost springtime, uh, it was Army training uh, with soldiers from the Mountain Warfare Training Center back east. Six of them get caught in a big avalanche. They take a long ride, 1,000 feet. Three of them get pretty badly hurt and beat up. Uh, this is an impressive storm cycle. In one week, they have over six feet of snow next door at Stowe. And in fact, at the upper part of the mountain, the weather service thinks it was probably closer to 100 inches of snow that fell. That morning, the 14th, 23 inches of snow fell. It even kept going during the morning. That's a lot of snow. Okay, these, what often people, when you read about the reports, you say they had a lot of experience. Did they? They had knowledge. One of them, the leader of the, of the training, had gone through an area level three. 
That's a lot of detail. It's a very great program. Um, so you've got that person. Then two of the other soldiers of the six had successfully completed level twos. They had the book sense, the knowledge. Yeah, did they have the experience? That's <clears throat> debatable. But they kept going. And in fact, a few days before, they even identified buried weak layers in the storm snow. Uh, one, of the, one of the soldiers that they're driving up that morning tells a student, this is classic avalanche conditions. You're going to see stuff today. Um, yeah, he's a pretty good forecaster uh, right there. They recognized the dangers. They saw them, but they dismissed them. They ignored them. They rationalized them away. And another important thing is they skipped the morning meeting, their risk meeting, because they were running behind. We've got to get this program going. We've got to keep moving with it. They missed that opportunity to interrupt, stop, and reevaluate. And fortunately, yeah, it's just, just injuries with it. This is an accident that happened. Uh, Echo Peak is on the south end of Lake Tahoe. Uh, these statements are from the person who is buried. I talked with the person who is buried and his other experienced person in the group. There's five people in this group. They're all expert skiers. Only two of them have backcountry experience. Three have no backcountry experience. This is their first time outside of the ski area. With the five people, they only have two sets of transceivers, probes and shovels. The two experienced fellows are actually pretty hard chargers. They ski in the backcountry typically 50 days or more each winter and have been doing it for at least a decade or two. In terms of avalanche training, eh, not so much. But they do go to those evening programs at the local sports shop or that the ski patrol puts on the community events. So they know, they know a bit, but they haven't been through formal uh, training. Remember this last one. It's going to just make several turns because it's untracked snow and it's steep. It looks so good. So I think we can see him starting off. In fact, right before he went, a friend in the group said, please don't do this. They all stayed more to the left. Now he's onto the 45 degree slope. Watch him, watch him, watch him. Good advice. Yeah, watch him. Okay, listen and watch what comes up here in a second or two. Okay, Karen, give me your beacon. Yes, give me your beacon. No, give me your beacon. I got a hand at this guy. He remained incredibly cool. Cool as a cucumber yeah. as he tried to solve this. No. They posted this, and these guys got flamed, which is unfortunate. Yes, they made some boneheaded moves. Okay. They admit it. Take your time. But they also put this out to show people, your, so don't be like us muscle. with it. And I'm going to make you suffer a little bit through this. I've edited it way down so you don't have to suffer through all of it. But it shows the reality of a rescue. It's tough to get the gear out, get your transceiver out. Where do the gloves go? You set them down, you drop them, you lose them. They trade packs. And I'll cut away from it in just a second or two. So now he's shuffled out. There. His, there's his uh, friend's hand. He's got his friend's backpack. He pulls out her shovel. There's, he can't find the handle. He doesn't have gloves, so, but hey, he starts digging. That's important with it. It's also remarkable in how yeah, many people in avalanche rescues suffer from frostbite because they set their gloves down and they lose them. Keep your gloves. So he starts digging. At one point, he throws the shovel down. The blade slides off. He has to go get it. You'll see his buddy here in just a second who's standing crotch deep in snow. He can't get up to him. And I show that because it's really important because when you first show up to a soft slab avalanche, and you're right there right after it happened. That snow can be so soft, it's like quickstand. And there have been numerous accidents where people have come down, companions came down, popped out of their skis, got onto the debris, and then sunk to their waist. And then when a search that should have taken five minutes, turns out taking 15, 20 minutes, or an hour, because they're trying to wallow through snow. Yeah. And fortunately, everybody ended up OK. So with accidents, how many times have you said this? What were they thinking? How could they miss those clues? They're so obvious. And then, you know, probably under breath say, geez, I'd, I'd never do something like that. OK, I'll admit to it. I think a lot of us have. Kind of an interesting thing, that first sentence, that first question, 
is really the key one. That's what we should be asking. Maybe not that directly, but asking, hey, why did it make sense for you to go do what you did? Because that's how we uncover the vulnerabilities. So my topics back to that, we're going to now talk, look at some accidents, the reporting, how accident reports are crafted, and then how they're reported out to us. So the way accident reports are done in the avalanche world, or just like accident reports everywhere else, we follow a law enforcement model where we absor absorb, we observe, and then we report. In the law enforcement world, they do that because everything they report has to be provable. But it, does, it tells us what happened, but it doesn't tell why it happened. But we take that information from the report and we write up, and the, all the avalanche centers do a great job now of, of giving very detailed information about reports. But again, it's about what happened and not why. And with this traditional approach, okay, what movie is that? That's an American cinema at its best with that film. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and who's the judge? Smales. Yeah, okay, good. I, I'm glad people know that part here with that. But again, we focus on the outcome, on what happened. But when we do that, we suffer from hindsight bias. And hindsight bias is very destructive to learning. And our solution, though, because we have this hindsight bias, is, well, get smarter, be careful, and just try harder. I mean, how many of you that are parents have told your kids that? <laughs> how many times have we been told that? So, let's see what Judge Smale says with Good this. idea. Next time, be more careful. Yeah, good idea. Let's be more, next time, be more careful. So, oops, you're going to go back here. Let's go back. There we go. So that what happened, that's kind of a first story. And what we're really interested in is the second story, or what's behind the curtain, a metaphor there. But it's a new approach, and it's what opens new doors to learning. And we're going to focus on the process rather than the outcome. That helps us find those vulnerabilities. And what we want to learn is why did it make sense for them to do what they did. And this is a very different way of thinking of accidents. So I'm going to throw up a bunch of terms and some concepts here. Uh, then we'll get into some dysfunctional momentum. But why do we have accidents? We have accidents because we don't think we're going to have accidents. They're unintentional. And that's really the definition of an accident. But I want to give it a little more detail because this is important just because I keep track of avalanche accidents, and Spencer does it in Colorado as well. Oh, isn't that a great? What are you going to tell your dad? Crash the horse into the tree. Uh, but it's this unfortunate, but it's this unexpected, unintentional event. An accident, I borrowed, these definitions are basically from the NTSB and the FAA with some, some minor tweaking for our world. But accidents are bad. Generally, they have tragic outcomes with them. As compared to an incident. In an incident, there's usually a negative I shouldn't say usually there's a negative consequence, but it's not a tragic consequence. Well, maybe that might, with the apes, that might turn into a tragic con consequence for uh, Mr. Ape there. But usually what we see with incidents are delays and closures. Say an avalanche hits the highway. It's an inconvenience. Nobody's hurt, but it's an inconvenience. Or an avalanche runs from out of, outside of the ski area into the ski area. And then there's near misses and close calls. In aviation, they have, they have limits and uh, you can fly and not fly in. But again, these are unintentional events, but they don't have that negative outcome. That's kind of a scary general over there. <laughs> maybe it's, oh, okay, that's my one comment on maybe our current political affairs and I'll leave it at that. But let's take and see what something Ethan has said. And, I think, and we know that 9 in 10 avalanche victims trigger their own avalanche. We're our own worst enemy. I've met the enemy. He's me. We're our own worst enemy. We either trigger the avalanche or someone in our group triggers the avalanche. And then he goes on and he adds that we even do this in the face of evidence. 
that's telling us that the danger is significant. It's warning us, but we keep going. And Ethan adds in that there must be these powerful psychological forces that override rational judgment. And I agree with everything up to that point. Because it's not what matters to me on the outside being the judge. What matters is to you, how you saw things, what your rationality was. So it's really whose rationality are we talking about? And there's external and internal. And in internal rationality, the term is this local rationality. Why did it make sense for that person, for that group to do what they did? And you also have to take into account at that time. When we're on the outside looking in, we can see, we, we, everything is very clear. Hindsight bias. Remember those mazes that we do in the back of magazines as kids? You know, get figured out, get through the center, or get to one end. What's the easiest way to cheat those? You start at the end and you work backwards. That's hindsight bias. I love Calvin. I try to keep my hairstyle in his look there. But uh, yeah, why does it seem so plausible and so idiotic in retrospect? Oh, learning lessons can be painful. But this is hindsight bias. When you're the actor, you're that participant doing things, you may see all of this information. You see all of these different paths, or maybe you only see one path with it. But you have to make this decision. But we're on the outside, we take a step out and we're looking back, we're looking at that person, that decision. We look at that outcome. Oh, it becomes very clear. And the problem with that is that bias is our judgment about the process. The problem is, this is a bias we cannot eliminate. We have to try and manage it. And I'll talk about that here just a little bit later. But we want to be alert for hindsight bias. Situational awareness, the term borrowed from aviation, used in medicine now, we practice it in the avalanche world with it. And it's knowing what's going on around you. It's taking all that information and all the different tools and resources you have to gather it and bring it in and start evaluating it. But for situational awareness to be effective, you have to be able to perceive it, comprehend it, and you have to be able to project it. So you have to be able to recognize it. You have to be able to make sense of it. You have to know what it means. And then you have to be able to project it. And a problem is, well, this is what experts can do. Intermediates can't even do this. This has been demonstrated in a bunch of different fields. You come out of an avalanche course. You've got very good training. You've gotten quite a bit of knowledge. You've got now the skills for perception. You may even have some pretty good ability to comprehend it. What does it mean? But you don't have the experience to project that into the future. So one of the big differences between experts and novices or the journeymen is the experts can see what's not there. They can see the connections. And that takes time and patience. Because for situational awareness to be effective, it's about sense making. This is a term we really haven't brought into the avalanche world. But it's a very important one. And there's kind of the key authors uh, in sense making, Brenda Durvin, Dave Snowden, Gary Klein, his name has appeared in the avalanche world over times. I like Gary's definition. This is the ability to, I'm sorry, the ability or the attempt to make sense of an ambiguous situation. Why does it make sense? And from this, you can develop situational awareness. And this is really important when you get into the context of complicated and complexity, and complexity is uncertainty. In the military world, they talk about VUCA, vulnerability, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. That sounds like a backcountry ski trip. So sense-making. In fact, the Marines are right in the middle of a four-year study about sense-making. Look at it, yeah, extracting the information, interpreting the meaning, connecting them with stories. That sounds like our avalanche world in what we're doing. But what's different in this is there uses empathy and the perspective and trying to gather it. It's not just, it's empathizing, it's knowing also with the people you're with. A very key part about sense-making is that you have to address 
your bias and other people's bias in your group, and uncertainties. You talk about them, you bring that up, and from that, you use your imagination, speculation. You make a story. You don't try to force something to fit the story, but you try to make a story, but then you have to keep reevaluating your story, checking on it as you get new and different information. But once you can make sense of things, now you can start to make decisions, or effective decisions. Dysfunctional momentum is a, is a concept that I think is pretty cool. It's, it comes about from the Wildlands Fire area. Uh, Michelle Barton and Kathleen Sutcliffe did this big study with all sorts of wildland firefighters from all across the, the spectrum. Interviewed hundreds and hundreds of leaders and firefighters. And I know it's kind of wordy there, but it's, it's what happens when you keep kind of plowing into things. You've got your plan and you just keep going with it. You don't stop to reevaluate, reexamine. Then I'm also going to add, talking to Don Sheriff last night, he, he reminded me that for there's a lot of experienced people get into trouble. They have a really great plan, a great travel plan, a great risk plan. They've put it together, they've talked about it, but then they decide to make a last second change or a last minute change. Remember the skier on Echo Peak? I'm just going to drop down, sneak a couple of turns in on the steep part. They deviate, that gets them in trouble. They didn't stop to reevaluate and consider. The Sheep Creek accident that some of you may know about in Colorado five years ago is a classic example of this. Six people had a plan, they had all the information, they had all the details, and they just plowed right in, right towards the bullseye with it and got in trouble. They didn't stop to ask for things making sense. So, dysfunctional momentum. How does it come about? Well, action orientation. That sounds like all of us. We like action. We like to be out there doing things, getting it done. Whether it's recreational or whether it's professional, we like doing things out there. But, and we maybe even like planning. But we become inflexible in our plans. We're going to stick on task. We're, going to, we're just going to go, we're going to make quick decisions. We want to keep moving on this. We rationalize the things we see. Oh, yeah, that's a little whooping, but we're still down in the valley. It's just in the willows, not a big deal with it. Oh, some shooting cracks, but we're in the flats. It's not a big deal. Oh, that's a recent avalanche. We're going to be on a slightly different slope, different aspect. So we start dismissing those things. Remember I said earlier, it's not about we miss them. We see them, we sense them, but then we dismiss them. It's called a de minimis error. And maybe some of you have heard about the normalization of deviance. Yeah, you keep doing risky things, you keep doing all of your stuff right at the edge. Suddenly edge doesn't become that big a deal except you're right at the edge with it. You have no room for error, no safety margin. Oh, and we like to pass the buck on to experts. Oh, well, let's get there and we'll follow what they say. What do we know about political pundits? It is the political season. How accurate are pundits? They're not accurate <laughs> at all, but they are experts. Experts are another resource, another tool for us to use. But we should challenge experts. You don't have to throw the gloves down and say, kid, what were you thinking? That was pretty stupid. I don't agree with you at all. But no, challenge them. Why are you thinking that? What's your approach to that? Don't just give in to their opinion. Because again, we're dealing with uncertainty. That bucket of uncertainty where we don't know. And don't ignore the ripple effects. You know, we tend to do that. Small little things. Something called normal accident theory is that it's a bunch of little small things that come together that lead to an accident. And I... How many of you have heard of the, the accident chain? And all you have to do is break the... If you break the accident chain, you can prevent the accident. Or the Swiss cheese method <clears throat> by Pero. All the holes, and we, line, we have these different layers of of cheese, so to speak, with different holes. And the whole idea is those layers are our safety net with different openings. And that helps 
Instead of having one channel all the way through, we can break it up. Yeah, so it's some different ways of thinking about accidents. But that's not how accidents happen in complexity. Accidents in dealing with complexity are much more like a net that fails. It's really just like a slab avalanche. Fails in one point, failure starts, and then fracture propagates out with it. And you, it's really hard to protect that whole net that's out there. So I think of accidents, avalanche accidents, as more of a net that fails, and it fails in several places at the same time. So if we want to stop dysfunctional momentum, and according to Barton and Sutcliffe, uh, and if you just Google dysfunctional momentum and, and their uh, article papers will, will show up, journal of behavior, they had a great magazine article in the MIT Sloan um, magazine as well a number of years ago. But they say you need to be humble. You have to recognize that you don't know everything. We don't know everything. And you have to be able to be skeptical about what you know. And you have to acknowledge what you don't know. And that you probably need to spend a little more time on what you don't know. Our usual way, if we don't know something, because the way that we are trained is in the analysis. It's not the process. And if you don't have enough information to make your analysis, what do you do? You don't have enough data. What do you do? You go out, you get more data. The problem is, generally, that more data we collect is the same sort of data that we've already collected. It's not about collecting more data. It's about collecting different data to start looking for different approaches. And for Barton and Sutcliffe, it's about the interruptions. Usually, interruptions are not thought of as to be a good thing for us in, in, in the West. But that interruption gives you a time to voice your concerns. It's a time to be skeptical of the experts, to seek some different alternatives, um, perspectives. And if you're a leader, whether it's with your recreational friends or professionally with patrols, guides, other forecasters, it's about being available. Not so much to answer the questions, but to help ask the questions so that we can look for the right, so we can look for that different data and consider those different alternatives. The interruptions are important. Yeah, and they say, yeah, it gives you that chance to re-examine and reconsider. So that time out, you know, if they had taken that time out in any of those accidents to talk about things, reevaluate, they may have made, they may have made different decisions. But they had at least that chance. How many of us have gone out on a on a on a day, conditions were kind of dicey, and we come back and we think, you know, boy, we were pretty lucky. I didn't feel good about it. But you didn't say anything during the day. You just kind of sucked it up. We've all been there. The interruption gives you that, that planned interruption gives you that chance to bring up that uneasiness that you're feeling. Ah, uh, the avocados diaboli. Worked well for the Catholic Church. Might be the only thing that worked well for them for about 400 some years. This is part of the canonization process. Again, this is a but the devil's advocate is something that we, that's generally not a good connotation for us. Because you don't want to be that person who's the pain in the butt. So, okay, let's have a devil's advocate. Okay, we'll, you know, we'll uh, have Ju um, Sue or, or Jim do it or something. Because they're always that pain in the butt. That's not a devil's advocate. A devil's advocate is a process. And the whole idea with it is not to pick sides or to fight a battle, but it's to explore the decision. It's to seek the alternative, seek more information and different information. And we get into trouble in how we implement the devil's advocate. And it's a process. You don't wait till the very end and say, okay, I think we had to ski this, but uh, hey, Lynn, do you want to be the devil's advocate <laughs> on this? Because at that point, when you wait to do it at that point, You've already made the decision, now you're picking sides. And it becomes a battle. Who's going to win? Is it going to be a winner or a loser? That's not the role of a devil's advocate. 
Devil's advocate advocates the process and expanding the process or zeroing in on the process to reduce the uncertainty with questioning, trying to learn more, and considering the alternatives. So it's a different approach. So what can we do to stay out of trouble? Okay, remember those five things? Well, look at them a little bit differently here. But when you're looking at accident reports, I'll try to use the mic. When you're looking at accident reports, you know, and please read the, the reports that the Avalanche Center has put out, because <clears throat> it has great sources of information, but it's incomplete with it. But put your, see, it. can I put myself in their shoes? People that got into trouble. And I've investigated thousands of accidents, and okay, there's one accident that I can't do that with. Only one. And it happened to a sea kayaker in Alaska. And I'm not a sea kayaker. But that's just really bad karma. If you get hit by an avalanche and you're sea kayaking. <laughs> and that's what happened. Person paddled up to the bottom of a coolar. It released naturally. Maybe there's some issues in that person's life from <laughs> previous things, but um, yeah, quite unusual with that. But almost every other accident I've ever read, I've been able to put myself in their shoes, or I was in their shoes. I'd done those things with it, because now it makes it personal. Now you're looking for vulnerabilities with it. As I talked about earlier, this whole point of the second story, why did it make sense for them to do what they did? And does that make sense to you in what they did? And then what we want to do is try to reduce that hindsight bias. We can't eliminate it. Once it's there, it's there. But we can manage it. And the way we manage it is not by focusing on the outcome, but by focusing on the process. Maybe considering alternatives to it. So these are the things that we can do when we're looking at accidents. And this is a different way of thinking about accidents. And I, I wish is, and I wrote accident reports for a long, long time. I'm guilty as charged. But I think we can do a better job of adding why accidents happened. And it may be just speculation or imagination. It's educated, typically, in how avalanche professionals can add that. But it gives us that extra bit of knowledge that now makes, that takes an accident report into even more of a learning report. So now we're out there traveling. We're on the mountain, we're headed up the valley, we're at the top, <clears throat> thinking about slopes, we're just planning about the day. Don't let dysfunctional momentum override your decisions and your judgment. What's the Okay, get a little nerdy here. What's the definition in physics, Newtonian mechanics, of momentum? Okay, I'll see who paid attention in high school. Okay, don't worry. Mass times velocity. Thank you. Exactly. Oh, if I had something to give you, I'd give you, ah, that's great attaboy. But mass times velocity. So the whole point about once momentum starts, what do we know from Newton's laws? It's hard to stop it with it. And you can change direction, but you have to add additional force to it. But something small little changes, accidents are not linear. They're not Newtonian. Because linear means that small inputs have small outputs. Big inputs have big outputs. In avalanche accidents and in dealing with complexity, typically we're dealing with small inputs creating big outputs. Kind of sound like George Carlin there. Now, that, sorry, George, that's a, no, no. Um, but that's something we have to think about. It's the small little things that can get us in big trouble when we're out there. So watch out for that dysfunctional momentum. Watch out for that, as, as Don Sheriff says, about that last second, that last minute change that's not a thoughtful change. Oh, I'm just going to throw a couple of turns in here. I'm going to hop off this. I'll throw a ski cut in here. Yeah, you might only be 50 meters over, but that's very different than what your original plan was. Practice sense-making. Empathize with the group. Try to understand where people are coming from. What are our biases? What 
<clears throat> what uncertainties might we be dealing with? Recognize those things. What information can we collect? Can we craft that into a story that makes sense? And then don't lock yourself into that story, but keep adjusting that story as things change. And use the devil's advocate. So it's back to those things. Those five things. Okay, quick last minute check. What are those five things? Okay, it's being humble. It's the sense making. And you can throw these out, toss them out if you want. And well, using imagination with it. What else do we have? Adding some devil, using the devil's advocate. And what about those interruptions? Yeah, we put the interruptions in. And what was that last sentence? And this I want you to all say again, not just to humor me, but so we personalize this message. That safety should be born in the belief, come on, I can't hear you. Class, come on. <clears throat> safety, let's hear, come on, let's hear it. Safety. The belief that everything I can do can lead to a potential disaster. Yeah, don't let that happen to you. Thank you very much. I think the, the hook is coming, but I'll turn it to Lynn. Dale, that was great. I, I really wish that I had heard Dale's presentation before I put my presentation together. Oh, sorry. No, no, don't apologize. Uh, I'm, we've got time for a couple questions. Who has a question for Dale? Oh, come on. Sure, with the, with the Maroon Bowl accident that I showed at Aspen Highlands, how did it kind of, how did they find the guy? How did the patrol get involved? All of that sort of stuff. So, yeah, they skied down, the two skiers did, they start skinning up, they trigger the avalanche, they get swept down. They call a friend, she calls 911, but by this time, other skiers, literally hundreds of other skiers, end up seeing the avalanche. They start reporting it to the patrol. The patrol starts looking at it with a spotting scope. They see him moving. And then they, with the spotting scope, they're able to spot his partner tangled up and wrapped around in a tree. So the patrol did not go out because of the avalanche danger. In fact, I think it was two days later because they needed conditions to, to stabilize out before they went in to recover uh, John's body with it. So that's, that's how that played out. Maybe another question and then... Yes, Yeah, is there a website? Where can you go to study to learn more about accident reports? The easiest way to do it is go to avalanche.org and look for accidents. And there's a wonderful, it's a wonderful site. It's really the portal to all avalanche information in the U.S. But you can use that site, avalanche.org, to get that information. Maybe that's it. Thank you very, very much. It's an honor to be here. Thanks a lot, Dale. Um, Dale will be available uh, in the lobby at breaks, and um, maybe not at lunch. He might have to hide out at lunch. And I, I bet you'll see Dale at the brew pub this evening. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. <laughs>